All righty. So this week, we're going to be covering chapter three, an introduction to prokaryotic cells. And in the process, we're also going to be talking about cells in general. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about cell structure. Uh, next time we meet, we will be talking about uh, how cells transport things in and out of the cell. All right, so today we're going to be going over this week's learning objectives. And then we will, um, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to questions. We'll talk about what a cell is. We'll go over essential cell parts. Then we'll talk about the different types of cells and the structure of bacterial cells. And then we'll go over what to do for next time. All right, so this week's learning objectives um, uh, that we'll be focusing on moving toward are uh, we're going to continue to talk about the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology. We'll be identifying microbial structures and connect the structures to their functions and identify pivotal components of microbial systems important to human health. All right, any questions? And what did I do with my electronic pen? It's going to be very interesting. Put it away. Sorry for the pause. My little electronic drawing pad will not work. There it is. All right. Um, if you do think of any questions, uh, let me know. I'm happy to, to answer them. But let us move on to what is a cell. Okay, so cells And let's go ahead and change color. Um, are the basic unit of life. Okay. So kind of like the atom is as small as we can go when we're talking about elements, cells are as small as we can go when we are talking about living things. Okay. So in talking about a cell, I'm going to combine it with the next topic, which is what are the essential parts of a cell? Okay, Because that'll help us define what is a cell and what's not a cell. So first off, the first structure we're going to talk about okay, is a cell membrane. Okay, all cell membranes are composed of phospholipids. Okay, so as a review from last week, okay, phospholipids have a phosphate head and they have um, fatty acids. Okay, one of them's unsaturated, so it's got a little kink in it, okay? So cell membranes are made up of phospho phospholipids, okay? Specifically, a phospholipid bilayer. Oops. So 
So if I were to draw my cartoon here bigger, okay, I've got my phospholipids. Okay. And their tails face each other. Okay. So if I were to continue drawing this, it would go all the way around, okay, providing a boundary between the inside and the outside of the cell. Okay. All right. So as review, these heads are what? Are they hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. Ah, you almost got it. Try it. Try it. There we go, Felix. Okay, and uh, you know, at the beginning, it's hard to keep these two separate. So it's okay if you get it backwards. You just keep working on it. We get enough repetitions until it goes into our long-term memory. All right. So the fatty acid tails are hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Phobic. Phobic. Okay. So the reason why they, they line up this way with their hydrophilic heads, okay, on the outside and the hydrophobic tails on the inside, okay, is because there is water on the outside of the cell and there is water on the inside. And so those hydrophilic heads, they all have a negative charge, interact with the water, okay? Whereas the hydrophobic tails are excluded by the water, they're scared of the water, so they turn inward so they can stay away from all of that water, okay? All right, any questions about that? Okay, so the cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer, okay, acts as a barrier. Okay, uh, as we talk about this next week, we're gonna talk about this more, okay? But the water has a hard time getting past this hydrophobic core, okay? So pretty much the outside stuff stays outside and the inside stuff stays inside, okay? So this hydrophobic center acts kind of like saran wrap around the cell, okay? So all cells have a cell membrane. If you don't have a cell membrane, you're not a cell. So it is a barrier that defines and controls the internal concentration of different nutrients and salts and different things, keeps the different parts of the cell together okay, and controls what comes in and out. Now, another thing that all cells have is a way for outside stuff to get inside and a way for the inside stuff to get out. Okay? So we'll talk about this more next time, but I wanna give you a preview. All cells have transporter proteins. So they are made up of proteins and they um, allow a okay, passage from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Okay? So we call those, uh, it's kind of like they're a gate. They're a gate in the barrier. Okay? Oh, by the way, with the cell membrane, um, it's called the plasma membrane in some types of cells and other types of cells, it's called the cell membrane. It's really the same structure. It's just the eukaryotic cell scientists named it one thing and the prokaryotic cell scientists named it another thing. For the purposes of this class, it's all the cell membrane. We're gonna simplify things, okay? 
All right, so that is two things that all cells have to have. Okay, they've got to have the cell membrane, which is a barrier between the outside and the inside. And we have transport proteins okay, that allow things to come and go in a controlled manner. Okay. All right, so this is the boundary of the cell. Okay. Let's go ahead and go inside. All cells have uh, DNA genes. Okay that we call a chromosome. Now, since we're talking about prokaryotes, I'm gonna draw this as a circular chromosome, okay? It's composed of DNA. So the DNA are the actual genes. Okay. So genes tell the cell how to make proteins, okay? How to make in the proteins, then make lipids and carbohydrates and all of the different things that the cell needs, okay? And holding that DNA um, so that it doesn't get tangled up and, and broken, okay? We have a protein scaffold. Okay, so oftentimes when we refer to the, the chromosome, We'll talk about just the DNA because, eh, you know, we're interested in the DNA, we're interested in the information. Okay, so it's kind of like the books in the library, but the books are on a shelf. Okay, we often don't talk about the shelves, but you got to have shelves in the library. Otherwise, the books are all in a stack and you can't find anything. Okay. All right. So all cells have a chromosome that is composed of DNA and a protein scaffold. Okay. All right. So this information, okay, in the DNA has to be translated into protein somehow. And there is a structure okay, um, that comes in two parts that is called a ribosome. Okay, so I'm going to blow up this ribosome bigger, partially because I'm not too happy with my cartoon on the cell, but also because we're going to be talking about it in more detail later on in the semester when we talk about this translation process. Okay. So ribosomes come in two subunits. They kind of look like a clamshell with some teeth. Okay. And this is the large subunit. And this is the small subunit. And we'll talk about this more later, okay? But information comes from the DNA, from the chromosome, and the ribosome clamps down on it and reads it to make proteins, okay? So ribosomes are composed of RNA. RNA is a cousin to DNA. And then they also have proteins. Okay. So ribosomes synthesize or make proteins. Okay, how are we doing so far? Okay, now there is one last thing, okay, that I personally consider essential, okay? All cells have this, okay? Oh, let's do more than that, but we'll, we'll do two more, okay? All right, so the ribosomes make proteins and one of these types of proteins are enzymes. Okay, enzymes are proteins that are the tools of the cell, okay? They're kind of like hammers and scissors and planers and that kind of thing, okay? Okay, now all of this stuff on the inside, okay, 
we call cytoplasm. It's kind of a, a gel. It's mainly water-based, but it holds all of this and it allows stuff to move around. Okay. So all cells have cytoplasm. So we'll go ahead and put that here. Okay, so it's basically everything inside of the cell that is not solid. Okay, so it's uh, and putting liquid down, but it really is more of a gel. Okay, kind of the consistency of slime. Okay, questions. Okay, all cells have these parts, okay? If you don't have these parts, you're not a cell, okay? But the really defining characteristic is the cell membrane, okay? Um, all cells have these other things, but this is really the, the defining characteristic. You've got to have a barrier between the outside and the inside, okay? All right, any questions? on what a cell is and what the essential parts are. What about the mitochondria? Ah, oh, that is a very good question, Isaac. Not all cells have mitochondria. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about eukaryotic cells, we'll be talking about mitochondria. Um, they are very important for our cells. If we don't have a well-functioning mitochondria, uh, we get really sick. And if you poison the mitochondria, we die, okay? But bacteria don't have mitochondria. Yeah, so interesting, huh? Yeah, so this is a basic stripped down version of a cell that has the parts that all cells, okay? That all cells have. But the main focus is bacterial cells, right? Yes, in this class, we're gonna focus mainly on bacterial cells. Yep. Uh, when you get to cell biology or to AMP, we focus more on eukaryotic cells. Anatomy and physiology, we focus on human cells. But these are the basic parts for bacterial cells. Bacteria and eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells, okay. Yeah, so and anything that's going to be called a cell has these parts. Whether they're bacteria, human cells, plant cells, uh, yeast cells, as long as they're a cell, they've got to have these parts. Okay. All right, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we've covered what is a cell. As a part of doing that, we've talked about essential cell parts. Okay. So before I start asking you questions, at least I don't think I asked a question. Oh, yes, I, I do have a question. So let's take a break. And I'm going to um, ask you this question. I'm going to pull up a poll. Okay, so which of the following is a cell or it is composed of cells? And please excuse that this is a five question poll. I ignore E. One of these times I'm going to remember to set up a four question poll. And yes, there is more than one right answer. So pick your favorite. Okay, we've got some good early voting. There, we just broke 50%. Ah, we broke 75%. We can keep going, we can keep going. Okay, I need two more. One more. I'm not gonna get my last person. Well, 93 is pretty good. 93% is pretty good. Okay, so most of you picked the bacterium that causes strep throat, which is one of the correct answers, okay? 
So tell me why it's the correct answer. Because as a cell wall. Uh, so it, the they cell do membrane. have a cell wall, but not all cells have a cell wall. I meant membrane. Oh, there we go. Very good. Yeah, My so membrane. it has a cell membrane. I know it's easy to get cell walls and cell membranes confused. They're just one word, word different. Okay, good job. Yes, and before we, you know, we were talking about how bacteria are cells, human cells are cells. Okay. All right, so um, now the others were not as popular, the bark from cork trees, <coughs> excuse me, or the virus that causes COVID, okay? Or the crystals in Himalayan pink salt. Okay, so this one is definitely a correct answer, okay? The bark from cork trees, okay? Why is it a correct answer? Because trees are living, so the bark would be made out of cells. Very good. Trees are living, therefore, the bark has to be made out of cells. Very good. Uh, by the way, bark on trees is kind of like human skin. The inner layer of the bark is alive. The outer layer is dead cells that are protecting the tree from the outside environment. Makes it so they don't leak sap all over the place. Okay, so very good. They are living, therefore, okay, they are alive, okay? Now you could argue this one both ways, both that it's not composed of cells and you could say that it is composed of cells. Hopefully on the test, I will not put anything so ambiguous, but uh, who would like to say why it would be considered composed of cells and why it would be considered not composed of cells? I'm sorry, what are we talking about again? I'm asking oh, the, oh, yeah, the crystals of Himalayan pink salt. Why well, it would be considered... Oh, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was talking over the top of you, sorry. I picked crystal, crystals in the Himalayan sea salt. Okay, so why... And by the way, it can be argued that they are composed of cells. Why? Because they have a structure? They do have a structure. Is it like okay, a crystal the, structure? Yeah, it does have a crystal structure, okay? Uh, cells generally don't have a crystal structure, but Himalayan pink salt is uh, actually sea salt. And so it was laid down by an ancient ocean and then we had uplift to form the, the Himalayas. And so there's all sorts of dead cells in there. <laughs> They're not alive anymore, but they used to be, okay? The actual pink salt, the actual crystals are not alive. They're uh, what we call inorganic, they're sodium chloride. They've dried out, they've formed these cute cubes that if you look at it under a, a microscope, you can see the cubes, yeah. So you could argue it both ways. It does have cells in it because, you know, ancient sea life, you know, that got layered in with the salt, okay? All right, so I purposely put viruses down. Okay, because it leads into our next topic, okay? Um, which is, uh, well, it, it actually goes back to essential cell parts. Okay. So let's talk about viruses and about the argument that the scientific community had for years. In fact, okay, I'm old. Uh, back when I was uh, an undergraduate, a graduate, the scientific community was still arguing about whether viruses were alive or not. Okay. So let's go ahead and clear the board and let's talk about uh, characteristics of life. Okay. Now, characteristics of life, we also spend decades discussing, okay, what makes a living thing alive, okay? It's one of these that we can go, well, yeah, that's definitely alive and that's not, but it's like, yeah, why? 
so that we can talk about when we get to something like viruses that are on the border between alive and, and not alive, um, we can define things, okay? So characteristics of life, so all cells do these things, okay? So they can take in nutrients, and get energy from it and get rid of waste, okay? We call this process metabolism. Okay, living things take things in, okay? And they maintain their order. Whereas, you know, things that are dead, they decay and they break down. Okay, they don't take energy in, okay? So living things, you know, have a metabolism. Okay, that's our first thing. Second thing is they can go from being small, from being babies, and they can grow, okay? So that's the second thing. Living things get bigger. They can grow, okay? Third thing is, once they get big enough, they can mature and reproduce. Okay, they can make little copies of themselves. Okay. And individuals can respond to the environment. So here's a macroscopic example, something that you've seen, okay? So it's in the winter. I go outside and I go, oh, I did not get a warm enough coat. I go back in, I get a warmer coat, okay? I'm responding to the environment. If we're talking, say, our pets, okay? Especially those that spend more time outside, okay? It gets cold, what do they do? They grow more fur, thicker, warmer fur. And when it warms up, they shed in big clumps, okay? They're responding to the environment, okay? When we're talking about bacteria, especially if you're looking at them under a light microscope, um, a lot of bacteria don't like light. <laughs> so they try to swim out away from the light if they can. <laughs> so they're responding to the environment. They're going, oh, bright light, bright light, and they're trying to get away from the light. Okay. So they respond, okay? So there's an environmental cue and they respond to that cue, okay? And then populations, populations of living things adapt to the environment. Okay, so they change over time, they evolve, okay? All right, so those are the characteristics of life and cells do that, okay? We have cells um, that are uh, simple cells, uh, bacteria that are single cell, and we see cells that are bigger and more complex, eukaryotic cells, and there are examples of eukaryotic cells that have learned how to work together and communicate. And that's what's happening in our body. We've got individual cells that have evolved to work together for, for an entire organism, okay? So humans are multicellular organisms, okay? My cells cannot live independently anymore, all right? So let's take a look at viruses and see how many of these characteristics of life, okay, they can, uh, that, they, that they do, okay? So viruses do not have an independent metabolism, okay? So no independent metabolism. 
Now, some people are going to say, hey, that makes them not alive. Well, there are cells that don't have independent metabolism. <laughs> they have to be inside. They have to parasite, be a parasite of another cell, okay? Because they're missing parts of their metabolism, okay? They can't do it on their own, okay? So for me, not having an independent metabolism does not count, okay? Um, because they can go in and they can take over a cell and use its metabolism to make more of itself, okay? Um, they reproduce, viruses make more of themselves, okay? So they replicate. As unfortunately, we well know, with COVID and with colds, you know, one person comes in coughing and sneezing and then pretty soon everybody else in the office has it, okay? So they're able to reproduce, okay? Um, viruses evolve over time, okay? As we know, okay, with COVID, we started out with which variant? You probably don't know this one. I don't think they even named the variant until after the second one came around. Yeah, we call it alpha because it was the first one. What was the second one? Well, the Delta. second one, the B Delta. Very good. And what are we now dealing with? Omicron. Wasn't there one in between the Delta and Omicron? There was, but it didn't spread very much. It didn't do very well. It didn't uh, compete very well with the other variants. Yeah. So you're Evolve. right. Evolve so, is mutation. Yeah, evolution is mutations. You get mutations. And the more favorable mutations do better in spread and the population changes, okay? So right now we have very few isolates, uh, folks going in for PCR tests and what have you, um, having uh, alpha because it's being outcompeted by Delta and Omicron. And between the two, Omicron's beaten um, Delta. Okay. It has changed, it is mutated, so that it's more infectious. Therefore, it's spreading better and is doing a better job. Also, it doesn't make us humans as sick. And so more of us don't know we have it, and so we spread it better. So it's doing a better job, so it's spreading. So the population has changed. The population is evolving. So it hooks to the host and just waits until it comes across somebody else and then that's how the virus is exchanged correct i know uh, kind of air kind pathways of. and what we touch and don't clean and stuff right right well what happens is it gets inside it grabs a hold of your cells gets into your cells makes more of itself gets out of your cells and then it's hanging out you know wherever you know, if I sneeze into my hand and then touch a doorknob, now it's on the doorknob. Somebody else touches the doorknob, they rub their eyes. Now they've got COVID, COVID in their sinuses. Yeah, and then, but if you said it's sometimes it's undetectable, we may not know that we have it. Right. So if we're I don't have, we're a host for the cell, and then we don't get sick, but we could get somebody else sick. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And so that means Omicron's doing a better job. Are you sure that's called being asymptomatic? Yes, it is called being asymptomatic, yes. Yep. Yeah, the only good thing about being asymptomatic is most asymptomatic people are not spreading as many virus as the folks who are coughing and sneezing and have a fever. Yeah, anyway, so. Anyway, so viruses have these three characteristics of life, okay? Um, and this is kind of weird, but there are a few viruses that can respond to their environment outside of the cell, okay? But most of them can't, so this would be a no. Let's go ahead and switch colors. So most viruses can't respond to their environment, okay? They also don't start out small and grow, okay? 
they make their parts and they snap together like parts of a machine, okay? Like little Lego parts, they snap together to form the virus, okay? So it's like they're little machines. And then here's the kicker. They do not have a cell membrane. Okay. So we have come down and decided that viruses are not alive. They are not composed of cells and you have to be a cell to be alive. So viruses are a cellular. Okay. So A is Latin for no. Okay. So we argued this for years, decades. Okay. But we have since decided, no, they're not alive. They don't have all the characteristics of life. So they are biologically active molecules. <laughs> if you want to uh, go with that, it's easier just to say they're viruses. Okay. Okay, any questions? Questions about why COVID is not a cell? Not made up of cells. I just, you said viruses aren't alive. Yep. It's just, I, I, just, I just can't wrap my mind around it because if it's not a living thing, how is it able to just replicate and do all that stuff that it's doing? And that is a very good question. And that's why we argued about that for years, <laughs> decades. <laughs> Personally, I agree with you. It does enough of the things that living things do that I would consider them the ultimate parasites. They've stripped down everything you don't need. And, uh, you know, they, they pillage and ransack cells for the stuff that, uh, you know, that they can steal. Uh, but what it is, is it's more like if, you know, um, if you're into sci-fi movies, okay? Uh, they're like uh, nanobots. Okay, they're little teeny tiny machines that get in to the cell factory and make more of themselves. <laughs> but they're not alive. They aren't alive. They're like androids. They look like living things, but they're not really alive. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, the android analogy was pretty good. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, they're like evil little machines. Okay. All right. I'm going to go to back to the PowerPoint because I have another question for you. Now this one, oh, oh, and why do we care? Okay. Um, I introduced the question of why do we care about what's composed of cells and whether they're not cells and why do we care whether a virus is a virus or a bacterium? It all depends upon treatment, okay? I cannot give somebody who has COVID something that would cure strep throat because they're very, very different, okay? So yeah, antibiotics do not cure viral infections, yeah. But we will talk more about that when we get to chapter six, when we talk about viruses. But I want you to be thinking about that early because, you know, repetition, repetition is how we learn. Okay, let's get to my question. All right. Okay, so why do we consider viruses a cellular? I'm going to reopen. Come on. There we go. Launch poll. Okay. So let's go ahead and have you answer this one. This time there is one correct answer. But this is practice for the test because I purposely set this up so we can talk about the different types of answers that you're going to see on the test. And it's okay if you get them wrong, this is practice. And it provides an excellent opportunity to chat about test taking uh, techniques. Okay, we're at 81%, 87. See if we can get to 100 this time. I need two more people to get to 
Uh, we're at 90. There we go. 100%. Good job. Okay. So most people picked, they do not have a cell membrane. Good job. Okay. That is, uh, in my opinion, the correct answer. You got to have a cell membrane to be a cell. If you don't have a cell membrane, you're not a cell. Okay. But they do not have an independent metabolism is a very good answer. And I would not put that on the test, okay? But, um, uh, you know, even though they don't have an independent metabolism, they do have a sort of metabolism. So it's kind of a eh, maybe answer. And I would not have that type of answer on the question that's too close to something else, okay? Very good. You guys remembered that they can reproduce. They can make more of themselves. So good job, okay? Now right, this, so oh, yes. So on the power, or when you were drawing, you said no independent metabolism, but now you're saying that they kind of do have one. Um, they do. So. Here, let's go back. They, they, um, they do have, uh, yeah, you're right. They do not have an independent metabolism, but they do kind of have a metabolism. So you're right. I did have two right answers on there. You are correct. It also, it also says they don't replicate. Did you say they do or they don't replicate? They do. They do. They, but they don't grow. Okay. They do make more of themselves, but they start out the same size they're ever going to be. Yeah, I should have drawn lines between the different parts of the table. So it was a little easier to read. Yeah, this is a situation where I, I you know, if, if this shows up on the test and later when you're going over the test with me, it's like, oh, you're right. I put two right answers on there. So I would go back in and I would give full points for this answer as well as for the one that I intended to be the correct answer. Okay. So if I see a high percentage of people missed a particular question, I always go back in and look to see if I made a mistake in writing the question. And I'll take that into account. Okay. So hopefully that's reassuring. Okay. Now this one, okay, this is a true statement. Okay. Um, but it doesn't answer the question. So you have to watch out for answers that are true statements but they don't answer the question. So the question is, why do we can, um, say that viruses are acellular, okay? Well, this is a true statement, but it's restating the question and it isn't answering it. Does that make sense? Okay. So why do I put answers like that, that are true statements, but they don't answer the question? Because when you become nurses, or psychiatrists or um, physical therapists or any of the career options that you're planning on, you're gonna be getting a lot of data from your patients, okay? When you take a case history, you get a lot of information and you have to sift through that information, okay? To figure out what answers the question of, okay, why is this person, why does this person have a sore throat, okay? Why does this person have pain in their knee? Okay. So you have to sift through the data to find the data that actually are going to answer the question. Okay, so I'm giving you practice in that. And yes, I do it on purpose. Okay. Also, I haven't gotten to one yet, but uh, um, uh, next time we meet, I will have a practice question that has what I call a joke answer. My intention is to relieve tension, to make you laugh. <laughs> because if you laugh, it reduces tension. You're more likely to remember what you know instead of staring down the barrel of the test and then you forget everything, okay? So don't pick the joke answers. <laughs> Just because they made you laugh, don't pick the joke answers. Usually I'll put a smiley face or I'll put, don't pick, this is supposed to be funny, okay? <laughs> All right, so questions, questions about this question.
Okay, let's move on to the next topic. Okay. All right. So just as a review, okay, all cells have certain characteristics, okay? Certain structures, okay? As a review, who would like to tell me some structures that all cells have? A cell membrane. Very good. They all have a cell membrane. Or it might be called a plasma membrane, but it's the same thing. Okay, what else do all cells have? Metabolism. They all have metabolism, okay? And so what are the structures that enable cells to have a metabolism? Is it the transporter proteins oh, or the uh, enzymes? Yes, yes they, oh, let's go ahead and put enzymes. Enzymes are definitely a part, but I'm gonna go ahead and put transporter proteins down. Okay, what else helps with metabolism? Enzymes. Enzyme proteins. Sorry, I heard two at the same time. Uh, enzyme protein. Okay, enzymes. Yes, they are proteins. So let's go ahead and put that down because that's good to review. Yeah. I heard another one. Ribosomes. Ribosomes. Okay, ribosomes are structures that are vital to the metabolism of the cell. Okay. All right, and what's the last thing? Starts with the C. Chromosome. Chromosome. Okay. So, because all cells have this, um, the ancestral cell, okay, had to have all of these things, okay? Actually, is probably a population of cells. And at some point, two groups of this ancestral population split and went their separate ways and stopped talking to each other and then started developing different changes. Okay. So they developed different structures. Okay. And we call them prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Okay. Now, we're gonna, next week, we're gonna talk more about eukaryotic cells, okay? But the big thing that makes a eukaryote a eukaryote, okay, is they have a nucleus, okay? A nucleus is a big membrane bound Okay, it's a membrane bound structure or organelle that encloses the chromosome. Okay, prokaryotic cells, no nucleus. Okay. They have a chromosome. Okay, because if you have to have a chromosome to be a cell, but it's not wrapped up and protected by a nucleus. Okay, that is what makes a, a eukaryotic cell a eukaryotic cell is that it has a nucleus. Eu means true, karyote means kernel or nucleus. Okay, so eukaryotic cells are cells that have a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do not, pro means before, okay? So it's before nucleus, and then we have true nucleus, okay? All right, how are we doing? Now, prokaryotic cells, okay, we have since split into two groups, okay? Bacteria, and archaea, okay? 
Um, we will be comparing and contrasting these three, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Okay. But in this class, we're mainly going to be focusing on bacteria. Okay. So I do have in this week and in next week's folder, I have a table showing the differences between the three. Okay. Um, but for the sake of time and lecture, I'll only be talking about eukaryote and bacteria. Okay. So next week we will go into eukaryotes in more detail. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about bacteria and I'll leave you to read about archaea. Okay. All right. Questions. Okay, hey, let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to answer. But let's go ahead and move on to the structures of bacterial cells. Okay. All right, and I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to back up and I'm going to do two different kinds of bacteria because they are important to uh, what we're going to be doing in lab. And they are important to uh, what we're going to be learning about in this class. Okay. So we have gram positive cells. Okay. And you remember from chapter one, they stain purple. Okay. So I'm writing the label in purple. Actually, it's a purplish blue. Okay. And gram negative stain pink. Actually, I think it looks more red. It's still in the red pink family. Okay. So I'm going to draw these two and we're going to look at their structures and we're going to look at the differences between the two. Okay. All right. So because they're cells, they have to have a what? Membrane. Very good. They both have cell membranes. Now, um, on the inside, okay, they have a chromosome composed of DNA. And when you look at them, they look pretty much the same. Okay. But in prokaryotic cells, the chromosome is circular. Later on, when we talk about eukaryotes, or I'm having a horrible time spelling that the second time. Let's try it again. Okay. Um, we have chromosomes that are in a line. They're linear. Okay. So that is the difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells is that prokaryotes have a circular chromosome. Sometime after the two populations separated, one decided to go with the circle route and one decided to go with the line. Okay. All right. So, because they're cells, they have ribosomes. I'm going to draw just one. Okay. And they have a certain size. Okay. We say they are 70S ribosomes. Okay. All prokaryotic cells have 70S ribosomes. So what in the world does 70S mean? Okay, ribos uh, the S is a mass measurement. But ribosomes are so teeny, teeny, tiny, we can't put them on a scale. Okay. So what we do to measure how much mass they have, how heavy they are, is we put them in a sugar solution and we put them in a centrifuge and we spin it around and we see how fast the ribosomes sink to the bottom, okay? Or the other cell components, but we're only going to be interested in the uh, 70 in the ribosomes for this class, okay? So 70S means 70 Svedberg units, okay? Now remember they come in two different parts. Okay, the large subunit 
is 50s, the small subunit is 30s. Okay, 50 and 30 do not add up to 70. That drove me crazy for years. I was going, my arithmetic is not that bad. <laughs> but remember, it's how fast they go through this heavy sugar solution. Okay, the two separate parts are like two skydivers falling separately. When they come together, they cover up some of their sticky out parts. And so it falls a little bit faster together than the two separately. Does that make sense? So it's not arithmetic, it's how fast it goes through that solution together versus separately. Okay. All right, how are we doing so far? As a preview for next time, eukaryotic cells have little bigger ribosomes, they're ADS ribosomes. So remember the smaller bacteria have a smaller ribosome. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, bacteria, 90% of them, actually I would even say 99% of them, have a cell wall. It is a semi-rigid or hard outer coating and bacteria have a nice, thick outer layer. Okay. And we call this outer layer the cell wall. And I'm going to have to extend my line so that it's clear that this label refers to the yellow part. Okay. And we call this a cell wall. Okay. In bacteria, it is composed of a molecule called peptidoglycan. Okay, you're probably going peptido who? Okay. Peptido means protein, glycan means glucose. Okay, so this is a protein and a sugar put together. Okay, now I bring up peptidoglycan, okay, um, on purpose, okay, because one, It'll be important when we talk about antibiotics, when we talk about the immune system, okay? And it's also a distinguishing characteristic of bacteria, okay? Only bacteria make peptidoglycan, okay? And that's part of why it's important in immunity is because when I'm a new little baby and they're cutting my umbilical cord and, you know, my tissues are for the first time exposed to bacteria, my immune system immediately knows that they are foreign because we don't make peptidoglycan. We never make peptidoglycan. And so it attacks right off. And that's why babies, generally speaking, do not get sick when you cut their umbilical cord. Cool, right? Okay, now another reason is um, because in chapter two, we learned about the major groups of macromolecules, okay? When we start talking about cells, the cells use those macromolecules as building materials to build more complex mo molecules and structures, okay? It's like the ribosome, okay, is composed of proteins and RNA, which is a nucleic acid, okay? The chromosome is DNA, which is a nucleic acid, and it's also composed of proteins, okay? So we put these different macromolecules, these big biological molecules together to make other stuff, okay? So peptidoglycan is a protein and a sugar, okay? Now the cell wall, okay, which not all cells have, okay, is another barrier to the outside. It's considered an external structure of the cell, okay, because it's outside the cell membrane, and it helps protect the cell, okay? So it acts for protection. It helps the cell maintain its shape. And um, next time we meet, we will be talking about how it prevents them from popping when they live in, say, lake water. Okay. Whereas if you take a human cell, 
and you drop it in distilled water, they're going to pop because <laughs> we don't have cell walls. Okay, so gram negative cells also have a peptidoglycan cell wall. Okay, but it's thin. Now, gram-negative cells have another layer outside of the cell wall, okay? So as a reminder, cell walls are outside of the cell because the boundary of the cell is the cell membrane. Gram-negative cells have another phospholipid bilayer on the outside of their peptidoglycan cell wall. Now, back in the day, we used to call this peptidoglycan cell wall and this outer membrane, okay, the cell wall. Uh, since then, they have decided to call it an, a cell envelope. And so some books you're going to see cell wall, meaning the outer membrane and the cell wall. Sometimes they're going to use the term uh, cell envelope, okay. And I'm going to have to go back to this book to see which one they use because it's been a while. Okay, so we have the outer membrane. It is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, just like the cell membrane is composed of. Okay, and it also acts as protection, okay? And this week in lab, there's a bit where it talks about how this extra layer of lipids prevents, actually that's next week, sorry. This is what happens when I read ahead. Uh -huh. um, anyway, it protects the cell and it prevents some things like antibiotics from getting in, okay? All right, how are we doing? Have I flipped your brains inside out yet? You did that a bit ago, but thanks I for did the that a bit ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I've got a few more structures to go over, and then I'll I'll go back to questions. Okay. Um, so some bacteria have flagella. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about flagella when it comes to eukaryotic cells. Okay, but prokaryotic flagella have a different structure. Okay, they have a protein disc here, okay, and another one here and here, and I think in gram negatives, we've got another one here. Then you have this protein rod that comes out, and it's like a little outboard motor, and it spins 360 degrees, okay, so it twirls around like this. And so it's like a little outboard motor on a, on a boat, okay? And so this is a flagellum, okay? Flagellum for one, flagella for more than one, okay? They're composed of protein because you can make any shape you want out of protein. And it's used in motility. Okay, in other words, moving the cell through its environment, okay? All right, some bacteria have little hairs that stick out, okay? And we call these fimbrae, okay? They're also composed of protein and they are involved in attachment. Okay, they grab a hold of other cells, surfaces, okay? So they're like little hands, okay? One last one, one last one, okay? Some bacteria are able to make pili. They are also, so a pilus is one, pili is more than one, they're composed of protein. They're a protein tube, Okay, that function in attachment. 
and transfer of genetic material. Okay, how are we doing? And this one doesn't matter if it's gram negative or gram positive, the, the fimbrae and the pilus and the right. flagellum are on both. Yep, the flagellum, the fimbrae and the pilus, um, you can find them on both gram positive and gram negative. Okay, okay cool, thank you. Yes, oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, but not all bacteria have flagella. Not all bacteria have fimbrae. Oh, I just remembered another one. I'm sorry. I know I'm flipping your brains inside out. Um, let us do one more. Okay, some bacteria have another sugar coating. And both gram positive and gram po and negative cells can have these. Um, it is a sugar coating that we call a glycocalyx. Okay, that's, um, it's either Greek or Latin, I forget which one, for sugar cups. So it's composed of carbs, okay, carbohydrates, and it functions in protection, okay, and attachment. And if it's tight to the surface of the cell, okay, we call it a capsule. If it's kind of loose and sticky, kind of like phlegm, we call it a slime layer. Okay, why do I care? Um, pathogens that have a capsule cause more severe disease than those that do not. Because generally speaking, it makes it hard for your white blood cells to take them out. It makes them slippery. So that when our immune systems go to grab them and eat them, they shoot across your tissues like wet bars of soap. Okay, that's, uh, that's an, uh, an exaggeration, but it's a good picture, isn't it? Okay, those are all the structures I want you to know. Okay, we have a few minutes left. You're going, no, I don't want to do questions, but they're good for you. Oh, yes, Angela. Can you explain the pillars again? Because my computer kind of cut out. Oh, sure. Let's go back to the whiteboard. Okay. So the pillars is a um, protein tube okay, that some bacteria have um, that allow attachment to another cell. Okay. And it allows them to pass genetic material from one cell to another. And when we get to chapter five, we're gonna be talking about cell line more. So all the things that you just discussed, some of these cells have them and some don't, correct? These are like right. extra bonus pieces. Yes. Okay. Here it's are the things like when you drew them, only this side has these and this side has those, it can be interchanged. It can be interchanged. Yeah, I just drew them on one side or the other just to, to you know, for space. Okay. But all bacteria, okay, have a circular chromosome and most of them have a peptidoglycan cell wall. There's a few exceptions. And the book talks about like um, mycoplasma bacterium. They have a mutation. They've lost the ability to make the peptidoglycan cell wall. And so they don't have one. They don't have one. So why do we care? Um, because when we use antibiotics that attack this cell wall, the peptidoglycan cell wall, mycobacterium are not affected by them. So if you have pneumonia caused by mycobacterium pneumoniae, or not mycobacterium, uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae, we're not gonna give you penicillin. All right, did that answer your question, Angela? Yes, thank you. All right, quite welcome. All right.
tell you what, we'll go through this one really quick, okay? Because uh, we've got um, about three minutes left and I have another meeting at seven. All right, so <laughs> which of the following is a structure that is found on the outs uh, on the outside of bacterial cells. So I'm going to relaunch the poll. We'll let you take a minute or two to answer that one. And yes, there's more than one right answer on this one. Okay, we're at 64 percent. Tell you what, for the sake of time, oh, we're now at 78. Let's we'll see if we can at least get to oh, 85, 92, 100 percent. Good job. Okay, so the favorite one is flagellum. Okay, good job. That is on the outside of the bacterial cell. Okay, the next favorite was cell wall. Good job. That is also on the outside. Okay. If you pick 70S ribosome or chromosome, that is okay. okay. Um, those are on the inside of bacterial cells, but this is practice, we're learning. And you're gonna remember that these are on the inside better, okay? All right, so my follow-up question would have been, okay, which ones are on the inside? Okay, the reason why I do that is when you are doing, say, my practice quiz, think about how I could change one or more of those questions so that um, I've got the same answer options, but I've got a different question. So a different answer is correct. Okay. That's a good study technique. Think about how I could change this up. Okay. All right. On to what to do for next time. Uh, actively study the structure of bacteria. Okay. What works for me is to draw them out from memory as well as I can and label the parts and put the functions of the parts, okay? What each of the parts, what chemicals they're made out of, whether it's protein, lipids, sugars, or yeah, or nucleic acids, or a combination. They're usually a combination, okay? Uh, work on filling in the chapter three section of the exam one study guide, okay? Remember, you have until Saturday to take the, take the test. And then, Oh, actually, no, 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 it's gonna open on Friday and you have until a week from Saturday to take the test, okay? And work on case study number two, which is due on Friday. Okay, any questions? Is the case study to do this Friday or next Friday? This Friday. And yeah. so is case study one? Yeah, case study one. And then just to be clear, the exam, we have a week to take it. Is that what you said? Yeah, you have a week and a day in which to take it. Okay, so it'll open on Friday at midnight and it'll close a week from Saturday at 11.59. And you can take it anytime during that time. But once you start it, you have an hour and 15 minutes to take it. So it's not like you can start it, leave to go take care of something and come back. Okay, and you have one attempt to take that exam? Yep, one attempt. Okay. Only case study one is due this Friday, correct? Right, only case study one is due this Friday. But I suggest you work on the biochemistry badge. Oh, excuse me, uh, the embedded tutor number one is also due this Friday. But most of you are wanting to meet with Rochelle to study for the exam anyway, right? Either in person or, well, not in person, over collaborate or on the discussion board. Okay, other questions. Do you have Next. any la last, oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, you can. I was just gonna ask if you had any last minute tips on um, just kind of like what you did when you were talking about studying and 
drawing, labeling parts and the functions. Do you have any tips on um, when we start working on our case study? Uh, yes, so um, tell you what, let's go ahead um, and I'm going to stop the PowerPoint. No, I do not want to keep my ink annotations. Uh, let me go to Blackboard and, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, I've stopped screen sharing. That was cute. Um, let me pull up Blackboard real quick. I thought I was in there, but it logged me out. Thank you very much. That's what happens when you don't have activity. It thinks you're done and it logs you out. So um, what works for me for the case study? Now I tell people I think upside down and backwards. Um, so <laughs> the way I do things is not necessarily how most people do. So I will show you how um, most people answer the questions and then I'll tell you what works for me. So let me open up case study. Tell you what, let's open up the example. We'll make that big and then I will open that up and share screen. Okay, so here's the example where I got you started. Okay, so most people, okay, will um, look up the information. Okay, they'll look at the question and they'll go and they'll look up the information. Okay, so for where I asked for the information used to solve the question, I want your references. Okay. Now for this first one, because I looked up and found the information in more than one place to answer this question, um, then I number them. Okay? And when I get over to the answer, then you'll notice I cite where I got each bit of information. Okay? So then the next column is basically, I wanna see your thought process. How did you answer the question? Okay, so it's kind of like in math where they ask you to show your work. Okay, I want you to show me how you figured the question out. Okay, and then here I have the actual question. Now you notice I don't have a whole lot in here. We've made this a table on purpose to encourage you to be concise. I'm not expecting real long answers, in other words. Okay, so that's how most people will do it. Okay, going from uh, left to right. Personally, I find it works better for me to do all of this and answer the question, okay? I look stuff up, I, I think through you know, my process and I come up with the answer. So I put the answer and then I have kept track of where I found everything. So once I put the answer down, I put my citations, I put in my in-text citations, okay? So I fill out this part and I fill out this part then I go back and I think, okay, how did I answer this question? Because sometimes it's intuitive and you have to unpack how you actually answered the question, okay? So the reason why we have this part, okay, and by the way, we have these case studies in all of the sections of uh, MMBS 111, um, is because we want to teach you the skills to solve problems. And we solve problems day in and day out, we all do it. But going from one context to another, it can be hard to, to take those skills from say, in figuring out you know, how much you need to buy this, that or the other for the Super Bowl party, okay? And taking that and applying it to figuring out what's wrong with the patient, okay? They're the same sorts of skills, okay? but we want to bring them to the forefront of your brain, help you see how you solve problems so that you can use them in any situation. Okay, that was a long-winded answer. Did that answer your question, Anna? Yep, thank you so much. Oh, quite welcome. Okay, Mitchell, you had a question. Yeah, so how do we, um, can you explain the 70 um, ribosome? Uh, the 70s again oh yes sure let's go back to the whiteboard okay so ribosomes come in two parts okay 
we have a large subunit. And when we get to genetics, this will make more sense to you, but I want you to see my cartoon so that it won't be brand, brand new information when we get to chapter five, okay? All right, so we've got a large subunit and we've got a small subunit. Okay, so unless it's making it an actual protein, it's just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm in these two different subunits. And in bacteria, this large subunit is 50S, the small subunit is 30S, okay? You put them together, they clamp together, and some of these sticky out projections, okay, get covered up, and they will centrifuge together at 70s. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And their job is to synthesize proteins. Okay. Okay. I've got time for one more question. Okay, just for the sake of time, um, actually, I want to stop share. All right, this silly thing. One set of controls covers up the other set, okay? And I'm gonna stop 